wish you could tilt it a little this way, then I don't believe you. Have to, you have to come around this way because you, you have the bad background. Move, move your chair over. If you, can. you guys look great. I think the background's perfect. Just don't. <laughs> very erudite. It's very messy. <laughs> Our whole life is. <laughs> still, a little further. We'll set it up better. Um, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I see we've already got about 50 participants. It's great. My name is Jasper Bors, and I'm the student president of the Buckley program. Also online is our membership director, Rosie Braceras, who will be co-moderating this event alongside me. I'm excited to welcome all of you to our Q&A with director Michael Pack and executive producer Gina Cabo Pack on their documentary, Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. I hope all of you were able to catch the screening last night, but um, I know I thought the movie was tremendous and really an important insight onto one of our um, most famous Supreme Court justices. So before we introduce our guests this afternoon, I wanna say a few words about the Buckley program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We host lectures, dinner seminars, fire and line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those on the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. I'll let Rosie now introduce our guests. Michael Pack is a documentary filmmaker who founded Manifold Productions in 1977. He later served as an executive at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and as a CEO of the Claremont Institute. From June 2020 to January 2021, Mr. Pack served as the CEO of the U.S. Agency for Global Media. He received his bachelor's degree in political science as well as his law degree from UC Berkeley. Gina Capo Pack currently serves as the president of Manifold Productions. In the past, she worked in corporate management, marketing, and personnel. Ms. Pack is a graduate of Hunter College of the City University of New York. Manifold Productions has produced numerous award-winning nationally broadcast documentaries, as well as corporate and educational films. Manifold Films have all been written, directed, and produced by Michael Pack. Mrs. Pack has worked in fundraising, promotion, and management since 1987 and served as an executive producer. With that, please join me in welcoming Mr. and Mrs. Pack virtually to Yale and to the Buckley program. Mm. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Rosie, good to be here. Great, um, and I just wanna say, this is a Q&A discussion, obviously, so to all of our audience members who are participating right now, please submit questions throughout. Um, we're gonna be more than happy to ask them on your behalf and pose them um, to Mr. and Mrs. Pack. Um, but I first wanna ask you both, uh, you know, what sort of motivated you to produce this film and why was it you know, in the last few years that this became such an important um, issue? You know, Justice Thomas has served for 29 years uh, on the court, um, you know, he's known as someone who keeps a low profile. And how, how did you convince him to participate? <laughs> well, we had heard, Jane and I had heard through mutual friends a few years ago, I mean, this year, this was many years in the making, that Justice Thomas was getting tired of having his story told by the people who did, who hit by his enemies, essentially, people who didn't agree with him. And he wanted to get a more balanced version of his story out there. So I did not know that much about him. And, no. and I, I met with him first one-on-one -on -one, and then with Gina at dinner. And, right. and, and when we met with him, it was obvious that he had a great story. I mean, a really great story. It, uh, uh, apart from just being, as you say, a very influential Supreme Court justice, he has a great personal life story, as those who watched it last night obviously know. You know, coming from dire poverty in the segregated South, raised by his grandfather who gave him good values, but was had only three months of education. To go from there to the Supreme Court is an amazing journey and only in America right. kind of story. Right. And of course, it had lots of twists and turns. His 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 painful. his, his painful. move into radicalism in the '60s right. and his his journey back and his battles with with his political enemies, culminating in the. Right. Anita Hill, uh, part of the his confirmation battle. It's a great story, great story. 
And we, initially, as we were initially gonna do a more standard documentary, but eventually I came to realize that really Justice Thomas is the best teller of his own story. And we came up with the idea of making the film, him talking directly to the camera, telling his story in his own words. And, and also we had all, as I, I think you implied Rosie or said, all my films have been on PBS, nationally broadcast, and we wanted this one to be too. And, <laughs> We are very focused on getting our films out, not only the people who might agree with us, but people who maybe haven't heard that point of view. And at PBS, particularly easier for them to put on something that this is Clarence Thomas view. You don't have to agree with it. You don't, you can take it or leave it, but it's worth hearing. And they very early on- Right, we're very supportive. Bought into that yeah. idea and were enthusiastic throughout. So- Which was it, great. It happened that as we worked on it, and even after we released it, it became more and more relevant. I mean, we began before really the Me Too movement started. Right, before the Kavanaugh hearings. Before the Kavanaugh hearings. Suddenly, Clarence Thomas's name kept coming up. And, you know, many people had really never gotten a hold of that story. And then there it was all over again, Anita Hill, the similar playbook. So... People, there was more focus on Clarence Thomas again. And, and now race, you know, now our <laughs> race is everywhere. So, it's and it was like, Clarence Thomas has an important different view of race than you get yeah. from the sort of woke people out there. Um, so anyway, we were luck, lucky in that sense that it became increasingly relevant and remained both interesting right. and controversial and has done very well. We're lucky he said yes. Yeah, and we're lucky to, he said to, yes. To doing this. Is there anything in particular that seems to resonate with viewers? Well, uh, I, well, it sort of depends on the viewer, right? I, I think that people who don't agree with Justice Thomas find especially his personal life story resonates and it actually resonates with everybody, you know, whatever their political views. I mean, he, he you know, came from really dire poverty, his struggles, as Gina was saying, so uh, you know, he tells it well and, and I think people empathize with him. Um, depending on your views, you and depending on your age, do you remember the Anita Hill hearings and how does that resonate with you? But so it really varies. Do you have anything? That well, I hear from a lot of viewers, uh, especially right now. Uh, but you know, I hear from like immigrant community people that are just like they they relate the immigrant story to his story. You know, where the the need to blend in and the the no going back, but you can't exactly fit, and, and you know all of those things. I hear that a lot, and and just, um, I mean, just even very particular things. I I'm surprised that people will like take the time to write to producers and want to say something. It's just very very moving. It's a very moving piece, I think. You know, one of the you know kind of best examples of the storytelling in the film, I thought, was the Anita Hill hearings and how you guys kind of worked around really a lot of the heated stuff that came back into the fore two years ago when I was a freshman at Yale mm -hmm. and the Kavanaugh hearings exploded. You know, how did you kind of approach that issue as a filmmaker, um, especially in kind of the way that you did? Well, um, we always knew we were gonna have a big sequence on the hearings, but I wanted to stay true to the structure of the film, that it was Clarence Thomas in his own words. So I wanted the viewer to see the hearings as he experienced it. So had it been a traditional documentary, we would have had multiple points of view and a lot of people were there and friends and enemies of him, of his talking, but, but I wanted people to see how he saw it more or less. So I kind of followed that. So even where he talks about, um, you know, so, so you see him and Jenny go into, into the room. There's a little more of Jenny in the hearings too. So you, you see it as I see it in, in the sense that the first part of the hearings was like an ordinary battle. And then when Anita Hill came, it entered into a new sort of surreal environment. And that's why we used, for instance, the, the Kafka clip at that moment, you know, that he felt he was going you know, into a Kafka-esque surrealistic <laughs> world. And we wanted to make that clear. That's sort of how he saw it rather right. than how maybe it's a, 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 you know someone an average American might see it or someone watching it on C-SPAN. So we stuck with that. But I also want to make sure that I had enough time for Anita Hill to make her charges and people understand it. So mm -hmm. we tried to strike that balance. So you mentioned that people have different views of Justice Thomas and people generally have pretty strong views of whether they like him or dislike him. It's pretty strong either way. 
Um, do you think the movie has changed anybody's opinion about him? Um, and how so? Well, I think it almost always makes people understand it better, whether they agreed with him or not. I don't think it actually ch changes their view on affirmative action, say, but it does change their view, I think, for almost everybody Absolutely. on Clarence Thomas. So the ones that don't like him say, well, I don't like him, I still don't agree with him, but I sort of understand where he's coming from. I understand his views and how they come from his own personal life. And, and those that agree with him, I, I think, maybe even agreed with him in a, in a kind of easy way, also understand the, the depth of his views. So I think that they, it changes their view of Clarence Thomas as a person, especially because he doesn't do a lot of media. You know, he's, he's been you know, reluctant to give interviews. You know, he's been burned by the media as the film describes during the confirmation battle. And so people don't know him that well. They may have opinions about him. They think they may think they know him and think they know his views, but they don't know the man. And I think knowing the man changes your, your views. Maybe not ideologically, maybe not on specific policy issues, but it, but it changes the, the underpinnings of it. You agree yeah. with that, Jane? One of the things that's interesting for me is people who sort of refuse to see the film. Like, no, I'm not, like, I'm not mm -hmm. interested. Like, I, like, cause I know everything. I know what I need to know. And that's really, that, that's something different. Oh, but most great. people, and uh, the PBS viewership, you know, this is a pretty broad, you know, this is not the, everyone who loves Clarence Thomas, it's not like showing it to, um, you know, a, a, a conservative outlet. And um, I must say many, many people, I, strangers wrote in about it really mm -hmm. saying that they felt glad they saw it, felt like they knew more. I mean, it's to learn is the idea. Mm -hmm. One of our uh, audience members says she was taken with the early film clips from Savannah um, yeah. and the area in which Thomas grew up. How did you recover it? And, you know, this footage, was it kind of found in archives or where, where were you able to uh, stitch to get stitch together those clips? Well, well, it is true, you know, that so the making a film is a very collaborative process. You know, since Gene and I are here at the end, we take the credit for the whole film. But actually, <laughs> of course, of a lot of people did work on it. And there were, there were several archivists working on it. And our associate producer pulled the archives together. And it was a long archival process to find the right stills and the right um, kind of archival footage. And also the editor who was, I think, instrumental in pulling this together and, and sifted through all that, yeah. Faith Jones. Um, so yeah, most of, all that stuff from the early, from his growing up in Savannah is archival with the exception of some stills that Clarence Thomas himself gave us of his family. But as Clarence Thomas likes to say, you know, we were, you know, they were poor. They didn't spend a lot of their money and, and time taking photographs of themselves and documenting their lives, right? I mean, the, in those days you had to have a camera, you had to buy film, you had to send out to be developed yeah. and they didn't do much yeah. of that. So even, even then that was sort of a problem, like there were not enough contemporaneous pictures of his grandfather. So actually his grandfather, even when, he, when, when we first show him to viewers is older than he would have been when Justice Thomas first saw him, which I think is a little bit too bad, but you have to deal with the archival stuff that you have. And then we shot there too in that in pinpoint. Right, right. But that would not Late, be the archival. Right, but I mean, then that's more footage that you're seeing. Mm. What was the hardest thing for you to cut from the documentary and why did you end up cutting it? <laughs> well, I mean, there, you know, so we, Gina made this point that it, Justice Thomas was very generous with his time and we interviewed him for over 30 hours over a six month period, him and his wife, Ginny. I don't believe any Supreme Court justice has given that kind of access, let alone one like Justice Thomas for whom it's even more unusual. So we had a lot of footage and he has a complicated life. Yeah. And so I have my favorites, the editor has her favorites, Gene and the other executive producers have their favorites. I mean, I, I, I often point to this. I mean, we, one thing that we did is we had a lot more about his jurisprudence that we cut out. I mean, we, he talked about other cases, we talked about other issues. I was gonna have a long sequence on the administrative state an, an area where he's really taken the lead and even clearly uh, initially different from Justice Scalia. And there was more about his relationship with Scalia in it too. But at the end of the day, <laughs> people were bored, even lawyers, even constitutional lawyers. Like, let's have a little less of that. So uh, we minimized that. 
in, in, for his personal story. So I don't know, you know, it's, you know we, we are always thinking that we'll do longer versions or we'll do versions targeted to law schools and yeah. we have all this footage. So I, th I hope that some of the things we took out will find their way back. One, one of the things that the movie seemed to fixate on for me a bit in the discussion of the Anita Hill hearings was uh, at the time, Senator Biden. Um, and that really struck me seeing him, you know, become very kind of much of, a, of an interrogator with um, Justice Thomas um, uh, at, when, when he was in that hearing room. You know, how, how did you kind of portray that relationship? Because it, it definitely seemed like there was kind of like a bit of antagonism between the two of them. And how do you think it kind of fits in with you know, President Biden being uh, where he's at, where where he is today. Um, how do you think hearing was was like formative for his political career? I, I think it was formative. I mean, we cut that sequence before he was president, obviously. Um, yeah, I think he, you know, he before he was running, even he, right? Even well, we, really... even before he was running. So um, it's true, I think, that he was sort of an interrogator both to Justice Thomas and Anita Hill. And he's actually apologized to Anita Hill, but not to Justice Thomas. And I would not hold my breath for that. But, you know, Justice Thomas felt, and, and we only did a little of his relationship with Joe Biden, that Joe Biden initially said, oh, I'll be friendly, don't worry. And then he had an agenda. I mean, that's how Justice Thomas saw it. So I wanted to again, be true to how Justice Thomas saw that uh, without dwelling too much on Senator Biden to try to communicate that kind of quickly. Um, I think that how it shaped him, I don't know. He's one I didn't get to interview and now my chances of interviewing him probably have gone down even more. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure how it shaped him. Um, he used his position uh, as head of the Judiciary Committee to promote himself politically, as does everybody. That is not a knock on, you know, on President Biden. Whether it made him aware of how to use these issues of race and gender, I don't know. It, you did get the feeling way back then in 91 that these older white senators didn't really understand the issue, understand how it played, understand how Americans responded to it. I mean, they've had many decades to catch up on that. I'm sure that was part of it for him. Uh, but I think it makes clear that uh, Joe Biden, you know, was never this sort of avuncular figure that didn't have an, uh, wasn't a sharp edged political fighter right from the beginning. One of the things, especially about the hearing that really struck me was this was kind of the first instance of the court of public opinion becoming a real force mm -hmm. in American politics. Um, this was really sort of the, and, and you know, Kavanaugh's hearings are another sort of iteration of this, but this was really kind of the watershed moment in which people were so captivated by what was happening on Capitol Hill that they were kind of glued to their TVs 24 seven, you know, waiting for news to come back to hear what would happen. Um, having studied that moment so closely for your film, you know, how do you think it's kind of transformed the American psyche or, or sort of our attitudes towards politics? I, I think you're right that I mean, there've been other things that have that, that kind of got people's attention, you know, back from the Army McCarthy hearings, Watergate, you know, I, the, uh, you know, the, then this, okay. and then, yeah, but oh, not on the Hill. Yeah. Um, but, I, but it does change as the technology changed so that this was early in C-SPAN. So people were able to watch it for hours and hours on end, live coming from the Hill unedited. And I think that that's what helped Clarence Thomas, you know, the People who watch the hearings, we make this, we allude to this in the documentary. By the end of the hearings, people believed him, not Anita Hill, at like two to one. And that included African-Americans, that included women. And I think it's because they saw the entire hearing. If it had been simply spun by, maybe it had been five years earlier, just spun by the three television networks, they would have taken clips and who knows what the clips would have led viewers to, to think. So I, I think that's how it had an impact. I mean, now when we're fascinated by something going on in Washington or in Congress, it's shaped by the media of today, you know, social media, you know, the internet and other things. But it is sort of interesting at the time, you know, this was like cable TV was new. Like we grew up, we just mm -hmm. listening to like three stations and they turned off at night. So this was like, everybody was fascinated to be watching this live for that many hours. So it was, 
it was a, a like a turning point in in some ways too because i don't think i paid that much attention before then but there we were could you talk a little bit how about how clarence thomas uh reacted to the cartoons uh that you sh showed uh in the documentary well i mean first of all I, I want to say that Clarence Thomas had no editorial input into this film at all, or Jimmy. They did not see it until it was completely cut. And Clarence Thomas did not see it until it was broadcast on PBS. And he, we are planning to get together and get his views on it, but I have never actually heard his opinion on the film. I've heard from other people that he thinks it's great, and I, I, and I know that Jimmy thinks it's great. I have never asked him what he thought of something like that. And I do not have the courage to ask him <laughs> what he thinks about that, actually. I don't want to know. I mean, look, one of the things, and this is one of the reasons that I'm really uh, grateful to Justice Thomas, is it's not just that he gave us 30 hours of his time, but that he really relived painful things on camera, uh, you know, under my questioning that he just didn't want to relive. I mean, yeah. it just wasn't fun. You alluded Even to this childhood. Earlier you know, things that were just, you know, the presents that never came, the promises never kept, kept. you know, there was a lot of disappointment and, yeah. and I mean, just extreme poverty and just not knowing, you know, food insecurity, all the things that just make life in the segregated South. Besides, I mean, but, that was but, just- But I don't, so I don't feel like if I talk to him, I'm gonna pull him through painful things all over again, <laughs> Rosie, I mean, it's, it's just, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, but I will say this, you know, now that I've had some of my own battles with the media, it's very painful to be attacked and to be attacked in this humiliating racist way. Right. Unfairly, I mean, I believe that Clarence Thomas and many other public figures say, well, I don't listen, I don't pay attention. And they try to develop a thick skin, but it is really impossible for it not to hurt. I, I've had this personally in Gina too. You think you're ignoring it, but you really can't. It's right. it's really bad. It's hard, and and it leaves scars. So, you know, and and it's shocking that people are willing to use this racist language. Uncle Tom being kind of the nicest term, you know, in a way that they wouldn't, as he says in the film, against any kind of liberal progressive African American. So, it's pretty shocking, and I and I I can't believe it doesn't still bother him. But but I don't know. And I'm not going to ask. <laughs> just being yeah. interviewed was very hard. It was just really hard to, mm. to for him to mm. go. Over, you know, Michael asking mm. these nonstop questions. I think it was. He mm. gave us a lot of his emotional self. Really, yeah, very generous with it. It struck me that a lot of the attacks that he received in the media, like, really brought something out in him that was very different. And I think his wife sort of noticed that and commented on it but he really changed like something like a, a switch was kind of flipped inside of him. Do you kind of agree with that? Did you notice that? Yeah, I think this was, this is part of this, the sense in which after the Anita Hill charges came out that it went into sort of surreal zone for him. And they were really super tired. I mean, they were worn out. We say that in the film, but you know, it's, it's, it's even more apparent, you know, and when you talk to him at length and, he had to pull on something deep to respond to these charges. And as he says, you know, he felt the need to fight back and he fought back in a way that ran counter to the advice of his handlers. I mean, his handler said, don't go in there and attack these senators. You want them to vote for you. It's stupid to go and accuse them of, you know, of, 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 of using the process in a, in a bad way. I mean, you should be nice to them. But he felt he needed to be out front and say what was on his mind and, and you know, hence the high tech lynching speech, you know, a big assault directly on those senators. And I think it came out from something deep inside him. I tried hard in the film to dramatize that moment and to give you the sense of how it emerged sort of out of his unconscious almost, you know, how he was half asleep in Senator Danforth's room and, and up it came. And that's, I think, how he experienced it. And I think that's right. So in that sense, it changed him at that moment. That's right. I, I think that's true, Jasper. You mentioned earlier that you, and it was evident in the film that we watched last night, um, that you focused on featuring Clarence Thomas and his wife um, exclusively. And why did you uh, feel that it was important to document 
Thomas in that way rather than in and cover his subjective truth rather than creating a film that was more objective. Well, it was always going to be a, a, a 90 minute or two hour film, right? So we had a limited canvas. And initially we were going to do it as a sort of standard PBS kind of film. We would interview 12 or so people, including critics of Justice Thomas, including personal friends, including supporters. But in talking to them, I mean, A, they didn't really know as much as he did. And I thought his voice would be drowned out. And, and especially even in the, just the Anita Hill hearings, you really, if you were gonna do them that way, you'd have to have pro Anita people, or you'd try to get Anita, you'd have to kind of go down the question of whether the, the truth or falseness of things she was saying, of which there are people to testify on both sides. So where was his story? Where was his voice? So I felt it would be better rather than diminish that and do that in a half way to sort of give him, give it fully over to his voice. And as I said earlier, that way, listeners know what they're getting. They're getting his view of his life, his view of the world, and they could agree with it or not agree with it. It's not my slanted approach to his life where I selectively pick these people. They can hear from him directly. And also he was just a very good teller of his life story. Not everybody is. He, and he has, a, I think, a great voice and a and great presence, which also not every brilliant person is necessarily either has a good life story or is a good speaker. I mean, you, that's not the only way to be brilliant. Um, so it seemed the right way to do it. And, you know, when you make a film, you have to sort of make choices. And that was an early and significant, not early, but medium early significant choice. Right. right. I think really it was, I mean, we had started down that first path because that's right. research wise, but uh, Michael just one day came up and said, this is what it's got to be. We don't always have someone who is alive, you know, that you're working on a bio and there they are and you don't, you right. want them to be there. So I, I agree. It was just, it was really perfect and helped it a lot. One of the perspectives I thought that might have been, you know, valuable to some extent would be Senator Danforth's because he really struck me as this mentor figure for Thomas. Um, what do you think their relationship was was like? You know, kind of, could you give us kind of a better sense of of how that influenced Thomas, especially in you know his years in the court? I think his relationship with Danforth was was very significant. Not ju not just in his years in the court, but but you know his first job out of law school. Um, and I did talk to Senator Danforth, and I did consider interviewing him originally. Um, and and I think you're right. His perspective is valuable. He's written a book which discusses his relationship with Clarence Thomas and gives his view of it. And, and by the way, it's my, I always think that people, documentaries should be a, a lure to read books. I mean, it's not the end of it. It's only, uh, it's only two hours. Clarence Thomas has written books. Jack Danforth has written a book. You know, there are a lot of books out there about, about the hearings and about Justice Thomas. Anita Hill has a book. I mean, you, uh, people should read both sides, I think. So, but I didn't really think, I mean, so Danforth's views would have been valuable and, you know, you give that up. On the other hand, you know, you know, he only saw partially what only saw it in part. And, you know, he, you know, Clarence Thomas, I thought was pretty strong in his talk about his relationship to Danforth and, you, you know, you see Danforth in the footage, so it's there, but I agree with you. It would have been a, you know, he has a lot to say, Senator Danforth. Um, and, Sorry. No, go ahead, Rosie. Uh, the documentary portrayed the racism resulting from MLK's assassination as the trigger for his abrupt descent into radicalism um, and the violent Cambridge demonstration for his equally abrupt ascent out of it. Were both the changes as abrupt as portrayed or were they more gradual and contemplated? Well, I think that the, I don't say, I'm not sure I agree with that interpretation of it. I think the, you know, the watching the um, uh, Martin Luther King assassination and hearing the other seminarians say, I hope that son of a bitch dies was the nail in the coffin for his vocation of, uh, of becoming a priest. It had been gradual. We did depict other things leading up to it. And there were more things, but we depicted at least two or three others, you know, getting that note, you know, and other things. But that was the thing that sort of pushed him over the line in deciding not to be a priest. Once he left the seminary, I mean, it was a sort of, 
it was a kind of descent into the times. I mean, the times, you know, I don't know if that was the only event, but as he said, it was the other stuff, as he says, KKK, you know, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, you know, you know, Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy and, right. you know, so, you know, it was everything else. So, yeah, I, I, and I remember those times, you know, and that is the temptation. And once mm -hmm. cut off from the moorings of his vocation and the seminary, I think he did descend into the, into that kind of feeling that race explained everything. Yeah, uh, and 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 the, the the riot was also, I think, in Cambridge, only one step of his kind of coming out of that. Right? I mean, that was the beginning of his beginning to question his radicalism, but it didn't end there. He was still a liberal Democrat by the time you know. Then, I mean, it, it, it went through Yale. Even at Yale, he was more like a libertarian, and right. he, you know, and it it took a while. He didn't really he voted for Reagan in 1980, so that was considerably later. You know, had these experiences thinking about black on black crime that we talk about in Missouri, working for Danforth. So no, these are processes. And we depicted, I think we tried to depict stages along the way. Very tough for documentaries to depict somebody's intellectual right. uh, develop and spiritual journeys because it's right. inter internal. Right. So we picked a whole bunch of steps along the way in both those things. There were no doubt, and there were many more steps, but we picked some of them to give him a sense of a process rather than one thing at a time. On, on the issue of race, one of the things that struck me was that, you know, constantly, especially, you know, when he was at, at the EO, when, you know, he was in his hearing, and when now he's been a justice, especially in this sort of the early years, is that he was kind of always perpetually seen as a traitor to one group or another, right? Mm -hmm. That he constantly kind of came under criticism for, you know, being as was quoted in Uncle Tom or, um, you know, not representing the black community. This, the statement from the NAACP chairman, I don't re recall his name, but at the time, you know, I think that was very powerful. How do you think that that kind of affected Thomas? Well, I, I think that the, I, for, for, I tried to depict the sense in which starting in 1980, when Juan Williams wrote that profile of him in, in, in uh, the Washington Post that he became a public figure, that he was attacked from then on all the way up to today yeah. by progressives that strongly disagreed with him. And especially, I think it is especially difficult to be attacked as a traitor to your race by civil rights leaders. Mm. But I think at the end of it, he sort of, and by the time the NAACP did not support his, his, uh, his nomination to the Supreme Court, he was already used to it. I mean, it still hurts. I think I made this point earlier about the cartoons. These things hurt, they hurt all the time, no matter what. Yeah. But I think he was sort of used to it, you know, and, and you know, he, he had that sense. And, you know, we included that comment that when he was born, his mother said he was too stubborn to cry. So stubbornness is a, is part of the Clarence Thomas's character going way back. And I think he's, in a way, some of these attacks on him made him realize that he had to stand up for what he believed in. He had to do his best to power through it and not let these people uh, wear him down. And uh, so I think that's how it all played out. I, I think it, all those things reached a kind of crescendo during the, the hearings, but they had been going on before and have gone on since. Right. And even his early life. In his early life, I think it really, being able to go back to his roots, his beginnings, it gives you really a sense that, you know, it's just so, so tough and he has to, he just has to keep rolling with it. And then, you know, he has these constant forks where he, he can't go back to the life he had before, but he can't, he doesn't really fit in the, you know, in the white school he's in. And it just, he's just had these tests all along and it seemed to, it, when you see it as a whole, you can see how he was just preparing for this very difficult and and we know. A audience member um, is wondering what the most surprising thing about Thomas was that you learned from interacting with him so much as a person and what was he like to work with? Well, I do feel that the thing that I learned most was this sort of resilience that Gina just outlined. Yeah. You know, that he didn't let these things drag him down and that he uh, had the sort of moral courage to persist. 
And I had some tests myself where I've thought back on Justice Thomas as an inspirational figure in those in that way. You know, th that in spite of the many things, and not just the political ones, that is, you were right to point to these others, Gina, that kind of could have dragged him down, he persisted and he right. refused to define himself as a victim, even though he, he grew up in amongst real racism, real uh, segregated South where there was really, you know, I mean, where the Ku Klux Klan marched through uh, Savannah. So he didn't define himself as a victim and he had this resilience. And so that's the thing that comes across most strongly to me from the life as a whole. Right. I have to say um, that he was not the easiest person to work with. He, He's you know, great. He was great. He was great, but he <laughs> had, he, you know, I mean, we, as Gina was saying, as I was saying, we put him through these painful things. He only he, Michael he, put him through these. He's great to the <laughs> Everybody else. Michael, nice has to everybody say, else, yeah. Michael has to ask <laughs> really nosy questions. Yeah, right. And it was just like so intense. Yeah, he was great to the crew. He's great to Gina. With, he's great. <laughs> he's eating with the kids, you know, he's staying with the, you know, the crew for lunch. And he was just, it was really hard for him but, to go to, to do this. But the bottom line of it is really, he, he was great in the sense that he was generous with his time. He answered these questions. He gave me these 30 hours. I thought at one point, at some points that he would might say, well, look enough. Well, I don't really get enough out of this time. But he really didn't. And he persisted because he of this. He said he'd do it and he's not going to back down. But, That's but in the end, and he let me take him to these places and, and ask him hard questions. So in that deeper sense, he was great to work with. But it was it was not easy for him, and it was you know so I appreciate that. Yeah, he's really someone who's sort of accumulated this reputation or um, character on the court that not many other justices are able to accomplish. You know, maybe Scalia is sort of another one, and Kavanaugh has his own legacy, of course, and his own kind of reputation. But that's independent of he's only been on the court for you know two years now. So um, in terms of Thomas, you know. He's often called the most conservative justice, or you know, he's often referred to as kind of this like bastion of conservative jurisprudence on the court. Does he kind of like wear that moniker proudly? You know, how, what what does he kind of think of people who say that about him, um, and who sort of view him as like an icon of the conservative movement? I'm not sure what he would say about that. I mean, we have Jenny's quote in the film that. Um, Justice Scalia called him a bloodthirsty originalist, and he thought of that as a badge of honor. So that's something of a clue. Um, I, I think he'd rather see himself as an originalist than as a conservative jurist, right? You know, he, but I, I think that I personally think, and this is just my opinion, that, you know, he is really it, the, the leader of the court right at the moment. You know, I mean, he is, it's really in some ways a Thomas court. I mean, it's obviously a Roberts court technically. But I, agree. I think that a lot of the ideas that he's fought for all his life, often with dissents, are now are being examined in a different sort of way, including his views of the administrative state, but, but other things as well. So I think it's an interesting moment for Justice Thomas on the right. court, and, and we'll see what the next several years are like. Right. And we'll see whether, you know, if there are any attempts to undermine the power of the court. We'll find out how all that plays out. Right. He's very independent-minded, too. I don't think he like he sees himself in some little box or other. He really is. That's true. That's a really important thing to him. And if even if people say they like him, then he's mad about that. You know, it's like you don't really. He just he really is. He wants to think for himself, and that's the most important thing for him. So we mentioned uh, Clarence Thomas um, as a conservative figure, um, it, but. Also, as you know, an Uncle Tom um, figure for which is you know not great. You know, it he gets deemed as an Uncle Tom figure. Um, what is your opinion regarding the backlash against the National Museum of African American History for not properly honoring Clarence Thomas? Well, I I think that is I think you are right, Rosie. To to tie it into the other attacks on Thomas. I think people have minimized and dismissed him for a long time. I think that's harder to do today for the reasons that sort of Jasper alludes to. I mean, now that he has such leadership role in the current court. But I, I think the, 
I was shocked that the African American History Museum at first had nothing about him and only under intense political pressure that they have a very small exhibit that's really just an offshoot of the Thurgood Marshall exhibit while they have a, a huge Anita Hill photos in truth to power. I think they don't understand figures like Justice Thomas and they don't appreciate them. Yeah. And I think it's sort of a shocking thing. It's similar in my mind to this move that Amazon made recently. I mean, you probably follow this a little. You know, our film after being on PBS was released digitally in the fall and it's been on Amazon since October. October. You can right. buy rent option or get the DVD and then it was on Prime. And then February 8th <laughs> in Black History Month, they, without telling us why, took it off. I mean, you could technically still buy the DVD, but it's permanently no, out, out of stock. And they stopped streaming it. And we, our distributor asked why, there's been a lot of press attention. I thought it might be an error, you know. But, but they haven't, they've had over a month, they haven't either responded or put it back. And they've had requests from people like the Wall Street Journal asking them why. And, and there's been a lot of attention. So it, that's the same thing. Amazon is acting in a way like the African American History Museum did, I think, to minimize and undervalue this extremely right. significant figure. And it's shocking. Even though I had did, made the documentary and I had it gone through the, th I followed the, the African American History Museum debate, I was still amazed that Amazon took it off, and we were extremely popular. Right. We were, the time we took it off, I think we were number sixteen in documentaries, and several days later we hit number one in documentaries. So, so it's not a big business decision. What right. is it? So you know, it's, you have to, you have right. to wonder. Right. Do, so. They're basically deciding what you get to see what you should but, watch. And that's it, but, that, but, that's but same you, with the museum, you know? But even though, you're, even though you're the students there have already seen it, anyone else who wants to see it can go to our website, manifoldproductions.com and- Still have DVDs. We're, we're still, we're still <laughs> selling some DVDs. And it's also the still on our website, you, you can you can still um, get to the, uh, the other uh, platforms that are still right. where, where it is available. Like Apple uh, iTunes, Xfinity, YouTube, YouTube, a lot of- So TV. I think, you know, so just because it's been canceled by Amazon, oh, other well. people can see it. Um, on that note, you know, the filmmaking and entertainment industry is on the whole is quite liberal and quite progressive. Um, how was it, you know, trying to kind of make a film that is about a conservative figure? And I think, you know, portrays him in a very positive light, rightly so. Um, and, you know, as someone who's really devoted to kind of American principles, you know, so did you, did you have any difficulties in the production process or sort of, was there any pushback prior to this Amazon um, film and, or debacle? And how did you deal with that? It was so hard in the production process. There were a lot of people who refused to work on it because, you know, industry professionals, cameramen, sound men, editors, editors, who, because they hated Clarence Thomas or they thought they hated Clarence Thomas. Or they Thomas. thought it might taint them right. in an industry right. that is Good very point. much, you know, right. lockstep. And it's right. very hard yeah. to be a conservative in this business. That's right. They thought they would have trouble getting to even work on work. a film. <laughs> but but I ha as, as we said earlier, I mean, PBS was always enthusiastic about it. Yeah. They were great. All of the 15 or so Manifold Productions films have been broadcast nationally on PBS. Whether they would still do that now that the sort of council culture is further advanced, way further advanced in only a year, I can't say. It's a lot of I surely hope so, but it would be hard. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, but it is a challenge. It is difficult to get these films done and especially to have, get them to an audience. I mean, the, the, it is hardly a level playing field between right of center and left of center documentaries. An audience member uh, asks, did Clarence Thomas feel that he had to step up after uh, Justice Scalia's passing as the originalist leader on the court? And you mentioned um, earlier um, that, you know, you had the part of the film of Scalia and Thomas's relationship um, that you had to cut from, from the film. So I was just wondering if you could touch on that a little bit. I'm not sure about that one. We, I mean, he definitely had, I mean, he was great friends with Scalia. It was a very important relationship to him. Um, but, you know, he disagreed with Justice Scalia about many things, uh, you know, and um, in some of them, Justice Scalia came over to J Clarence Thomas's point of view and in other ways they were, they were different. 
um, in particular on natural law, which is a big part of the documentary, or at least a big part of the documentary's focus on his jurisprudence. And of course it's called created equal. Uh, Justice Scalia was skeptical about natural law and it was important to Justice Thomas. So it, it's not like there were, a, you know, there were carbon copies as people on the left like to make them. I'm not sh sure whether he, wh to what extent he feels the need to fill the void. I mean, and then of course it, the political situation has changed a lot in a lot of other ways and the court has changed a lot since Scalia's passing. I think that, that, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think that he's always fought for what he believes in. Right. Now it's got, it's a different political structure there. I'm sure that he will not waver. Um, and it, and it, but it is, it may be so. I heard other people speculate as that audience member did that maybe he is feel that maybe he is feeling the need to take more intellectual leadership. But I think he was always in his own way, an intellectual leader. Scalia got a lot of the ink. He was a very colorful character and, and loved the attention in a way that Justice Thomas does not. So that's changed things too, I think. Do you think his, his um, Catholicism has shaped his jurisprudence and his sort of intellectual development in other ways and just kind of this influence of natural law? Um, you know, he's had like this kind of very twisty journey towards becoming a Catholic. Um, that was one of the things that kind of struck me about the um, film. Um, so yeah, how, how, how does kind of his Catholicism, because it does seem like religion is sort of a big force for uh, the current lineup of Supreme Court justices. So do you think his, the way religion impacts him is different from the way it impacts any of the other justices? Well, religion is a big part of Justice Thomas's life. It's very important to him. He says this prayer for humility every day. And I like to say, it's a good thing. There's not a lot of humility in the town of Washington DC where we are right now. Uh, it's pretty rare among political figures of any, of, you know, any ideology. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, I, th I dramatized in the film and I feel strongly that his religious convictions are what enables him to stand up for what he believes in. You know, it enabled him to go on. And during the, especially that difficult period with Anita Hill, they really, both Justice Thomas and Ginny said they had to fall back on their faith. You know, they, they felt stripped of everything else. So I think his faith is important to him. It's tricky to see how it shapes his jurisprudence. I'm not sure what he would say about that. Yeah. I think that what you said already, Jasper, is right, that the, the, the natural law aspect is something that is pretty, you know, it's, it's, it has a home in both Catholic thinking and in, uh, you know, kind of conservative jurisprudence. So I'm not sure how it shapes him. It shapes him as a man. And at, of course, you know, your, who you are as a person, it shapes your, you know, your jurisprudence like everything else. But I'm not sure I could draw any one-to-one -one lines between them. What, what lessons do you hope audience members, you know, are going to draw from your film? Um, were you kind of, did you make it with a specific message in mind? Um, it struck me as something that was very deeply about what it means to be an American, um, that the American dream is still alive. Those were certainly themes that I sort of observed throughout the film. But, you know, did you have kind of a, a narrative in mind when you were setting out to, to storyboard it and to kind of, you know, think about how you were going to portray Thomas's story? Well, I think you're right that it has themes rather than one thing that you're supposed to take away, you know, a message. Um, and, and I think it does raise questions about race and, and being an American and, you know, and as well as casting light on the history of the decades that Justice Thomas lived through from the right. late 40s to today. Um, I, I do think that his life presides, provides this example of both resilience and standing up for yourself that I think is good. Yeah. Um, but I, I think people, I wanted to portray him in full and let people take what messages they wish from his life. Do you right. want to add to that, Gina? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's from your point earlier about his Catholic upbringing, his Catholic, his, where it is exactly in his life is different from, you know, we saw this evolve and that was such, he would say, I think, uh, that this time he spent with these nuns who believed in him, who held him to ha very high standards, you know, who just kept, you know, kept him pushing forward. These things really shaped his character. And I think it's the character in the end that really makes him who he is. So, you know, it's, it's just, when you have the privilege of going through someone's whole life, you really get to lay that out. And 
the takeaway is the takeaway. And I, I do know many people said what your very first uh, uh, question, questioner said, you know, well, what about all the other things? And it's like, you know, it's just from one point of view, but it, it is actually that is so um, in a way vital this in this case, because he, it's in the title, you know, he gets to say it in his own words. And that's what people hadn't really heard. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's not much support for uh, conservative documentaries as a whole. Um, what do you think needs to be done to improve this um, and make it, um, you know, able to, the industry able to portray conservative figures fairly? Well, I mean, um, I feel that the sort of liberal progressive forces have done a great job over many decades developing institutions to nourish and sustain progressive filmmakers and they're to their credit really. And people who have a, a more conservative view need to build those also those kinds of institutions and chief among them are film schools. I mean, almost everybody has a film school and film schools are really dominated by liberal and progressive professors and who communicate that to their to their students. And so there, I mean, you know, there are thousands and thousands of such film schools around the country. And there isn't any that are training people in, I think, just a more traditional approach to even telling American history stories, let alone controversial history stories like Clarence Thomas. I mean, we've done documentaries, for instance, on George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. And I think it's harder even to tell straight historical stories about the distant past, let alone the recent past. And I think people are not being properly trained to do it. And I think that it starts in film school, but it goes all the way along the way. I mean, it's, it's and then there are, you know, then there's- There's mentoring and nurturing. Right, people. and there, there are distribution companies, it's there are educational hard. film companies, right. there are, pro, you know, uh, PR companies, there are- um, Sundance. Film you know? festivals. <laughs> I mean, there's a superstructure and PBS itself has a big structure for nurturing people whose views more conform with their own. So it's, yeah. so anyone that's right of center is pushing against this very vast tide. I think they need to have encouragement from, there have to be other institutions that are helping people with those points of view. What is your advice to current film students um, or people who want to enter the film industry who are conservative? Well, I, would like, I think we need way more of them, so I want to encourage those people, <laughs> Rather, which maybe I didn't do a few minutes ago in the last part. <laughs> but, uh, but look, I, I mean, I, I think the PBS story is still a good one. I mean, they have been supportive of me my entire career and my politics are what they are. And they, and they, they know it. Right? And they know it, but my right. films are not essentially political. Even the Clarence Thomas film, you know, we remain true to letting him tell his story and the people who don't agree with him are, are not beaten over the head with his ideas. They understand them and they can still reject them. And, and, and so we have been persistent with PBS and they have been to their credit open to having other views. And I think conservative documentary makers can push through. I would say this, I, and I, on the right, I often hear people, you know, and I've heard this from PBS, you know, they say, well, all these people on the right, they're making these documentaries and they're not very good. And those people at PBS have a point. Lots of conservative documentaries are not good. And conservative documentary makers, even more than liberal ones, seem to think that just because they're conservative, that's enough, or they have a yeah. different view on race, or they have a different view on the economy or on China or something. Right but they have to actually make a good film and there are precious few on the right. And, and I, I think they have to, my advice would be to at least learn how to make films and take the process seriously right. and make, don't release your film until it's actually right. Um, so we have no tried- what to, your friends tell you. We have tried to mentor people as, yes. we, as best we can. And I think that's an important thing. Right. Um, I, I feel strongly that the quality of filmmaking on the left is very high. I mean, there are a lot of great, left-wing documentary makers. Some of them are our personal friends. Right. There is a dearth of talent on the right. That's the fact. It's not just bias. There's way more talent on the left. It's partially because they're nurtured. It's partially because there's film school. It's partially because there's 
there are liberal foundations that support them and fund them. Right. But on the other hand, that so is also the reality. Well, so when more come out, it's easier to have to indeed. pick, you know, it's the, the cream will rise to the top and the rest. But if there are so few on our side, I think that is a problem. It's a problem. We just don't have, we're not just churning out zillions, <laughs> you know, so. It, it is a problem. <laughs> One of our, our audience members, I want to try to get to all of our audience questions here before we have to go, but one of our audience members wants to know how is the interviewing process different for, you know, uh, Justice Thomas and then his wife as well. Um, and I'd also add, you know, wh where, wh wh where did that decision come from? Was it Thomas who said, you know, I'd love to have my wife participate in this as well? Or did you feel that it was necessary to get her perspective? Well, I'll answer that last part of the question. So the only suggestion in the entirety of the process of making this film over multiple years that Justice Thomas ever made was to interview Ginny. <laughs> his wife. And, and so I decided I was really originally not going to interview her, but the only suggestion he made, and he didn't say you have to do it. And he made it because when I was asking him about the, the, you know, the nomination process, the Anita Hill part of the process, he was having trouble answering things. And he thought she could answer things about what they went through. And he was right. He was obviously right. You know, he, he, you know, he, he refused to watch it. She watched yeah. it. She was his eyes and ears. She's, mm. she, she was with him in a deep way during that process. He was right. It, it was, a, it was clearly a good suggestion when he made it. And it was his only suggestion. So I did interview her. Um, it wasn't easy for her either. It I was, mean, it, it, I, I, I kind of thought she would have like a whole line. Of, she wouldn't be very, you know, it was not forthcoming, easy. but she was crying, but, you know. <laughs> You but, could see some of on the film. She was. But this was a bit. We but, were crying. But for both of them, it, it was this long interview process where we, it was multiple hours yeah. taking them through very carefully their life, and and I had a device that let them look directly in the camera, a mirror device that let that uh, tried to keep their eye lines directly to the camera. So that's what the process was like. Yeah. Um. And it, and it was a, you know for them a painful process, right. especially that part of it. Yeah. So. As a um, documentary maker, how do you decide what questions to ask? You mentioned that it's, you know, that you ask a ton of questions that, that it was hard for Thomas to answer some of them. Um, and how do you make the decision of what questions to ask? Well, look, there are all these books about his life, many books, including his own memoirs, which we have some of in the film. So, Unlike in other stories where you're finding the story, the story is there really, you know, I mean, it's been covered in lots of ways. So I was really able to sort of map it out what, how I more or less saw the story going. And I had a lot of questions. I didn't always ask them the questions that I had on my list, but I had the idea where the story was supposed to go. I mean, Justice Thomas, people answer questions differently. Justice Thomas gives long answers to questions, four or five minute answers. Ginny is closer to like the normal <laughs> 30 to 45 second answer. So, but Jess Thomas would give these long answers and I have to keep in mind where I was in my story process. So I had that, I had that idea that, that the notion of the story that we wanted to tell, it did evolve based on what they actually did say. And it took a long time to edit the film, a very long time. We had the 30 hours and, and I had this idea, but it took, just took many almost months to, to do. Right. Yeah, almost a year. Almost a year. Do you think this was something that he, you know, engaged in kind of this project of like really self-reflection? Do you think that this had like a personal impact on him going through? I'm not sure. I mean, he had written a memoir, so he had done that once before. I don't know what the effect of, uh, for him on reliving it was. I have not... I don't have that personal enough relationship to him to figure that out. It, I think it must have, how, how that played out, I don't know. I mean, we went through most of the interview before the Kavanaugh hearing and it had to be so that the Kavanaugh hearing itself must have had a big flashback for Justice Thomas to his own hearing. I mean, the playbooks were incredibly similar between these two hearings and it was really shocking. I mean, just even to the point of waiting till very, very late to reduce, to, to drop the bombshell of the sexual harassment charges and the whole form of it. So I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I think it must've had an impact. I'm not sure what it is. 
Well, thank you so much, Mr. and Mrs. Pack. It was really uh, great to have you. I just asked one final question because some of our audience members asked it. Um, where can we watch the documentary? If some of us want to watch it again or some of us want to watch it uh, for the first time, I know there were some people in the audience today who hadn't seen it yesterday. A question great. for you. Well, you can go to our website, manifoldproductions.com. Uh, we also have justicethomasmovie.com. And you can find in the, um, you know, the, there are several platforms that are still, that still have it available digitally. And there are some DVDs mm -hmm. in there. They're a little bit slow on going out now because mm -hmm. we're, we picked up all that business from Amazon. So, um, but it can, it's, it's around. Great. Well, I want to thank you both again for your time um, and for talking about your really wonderful film. Thanks for arranging. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks so much. I'm